Stanford University. I'm r uh, roughly your age, and I come, not today, but back when I first started, and I came uh, out here with my dad, and uh, he and I had talked about venture capital uh, for years. He had been in the investment banking business, but there was only J.H. Whitney and, uh, in New York and the Rockefellers. And then in Boston, there was these, um, this uh, American research and development that had been started by a guy who taught me uh, so-called manufacturing. It was basically his philosophy of life. He was a Frenchman, but he very creative, and everybody loved uh, George Dorio. Uh, we were the first venture capital company in the West. I was one of five young guys, uh, only one of whom had been in the investment business. I have been in the steel business, and a couple others. Uh, and we, um, we settled on the Stanford campus. The three senior people were my father and his, uh, his uh, assistant or deputy, they were both rank of ambassador, running the Marshall Plan in Paris. And Averill Harriman, who ran it out of Washington, to told uh, my dad that as a deputy, he would probably do well with a guy named uh, Fred Anderson, who had, was then run, had run the 8th Bomber Command during the war uh, out of Berlin, out of uh, England, and he bombed, uh, you know, and there was a, a movie written about him uh, um, called uh, 12, I think it was 12 O'Clock High or something like that. And uh, he was, um, uh, wasn't Clark Gable, but it was a famous movie star that played his part. And he was a risk taker and fit perfectly. My dad was more conservative, had been with, uh, with Dylan Reed, which was like Morgan Stanley in those days, long before Goldman Sachs really took over the territory. And uh, <clears throat> we all came out here. Nobody knew it. How, uh, Anderson had made a couple of investments because he had been uh, out at the, the Travis Air Force Base near uh, north of San Francisco for quite a while. And he knew San Francisco. And he made a couple of private investments. And my dad knew investment banking. And one other young guy who was the first backer of uh, Oracle, as a matter of fact, Don Lucas, was the only one that had, had any investment banking experience. So we all got together in my first deal was right down the street, um, brought to me by a friend, Reed Dennis. And he uh, said, you know, Draper, take a look at this uh, company, Corbin Farnsworth. And Corbin Farnsworth made uh, uh, defibrillators. And I said, well, Elliot, what is a defibrillator? And he said, well, lie down, Bill, I'll show you. And he pulls out this huge paddle and puts it on my plug, starts to plug it in. He didn't, uh, but uh, I'm still here, luckily. And the, uh, and the result was a very successful first, hi, first uh, experience, uh, first uh, defibrillator in the world. And it saved hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives uh, probably millions of lives uh, since. So, and that was my very first deal. So the thrill of, of um, saving lives and making a lot of money in that order is really exciting. Um, and it was my first deal and I was very excited about it. Then uh, we, um, we ended up doing quite a few other deals at Draper, Gaither and Anderson but um, I decided to go off on my own. And the reason for that was after three years. And the reason for that was just simply to um, you know, do my own thing, which a lot of you are in this class, because that's what you want to do. And I encourage you to do it big time. 
Uh, and so I got a guy I met, P Pitch Johnson, who I'd met out at uh, Inland Steel. And Pitch and I had grown, our families had uh, spent three or four years together uh, in uh, East Chicago, Indiana. And Pitch uh, had gone to Stanford. His father had been uh, coach of the of the track team here. He knew a lot of people in the valley. Uh, there wasn't, it wasn't called the valley then, by the way, in Palo Alto. And uh, so he was a good connection. He was an engineer. I, I felt, geez, I'm a history major from Yale. I gotta have somebody who knows what this is so, so, when they, so I don't have to ask what a defibrillator is. Although nobody knew what it was at that day. So uh, we fit together very well. And we made a couple of deals, got our paper, a picture on the front page of the Palo Alto Times backing our first deal out of that, which was a, a um, it was, a, a, it, it, it shoved underweight boxes in a, an assembly line off the line if, by weight, it was, you know, measured the weight in, in, in action. Started by a guy who, um, uh, Joe Julie, who was, uh, became a good friend later, and Henry Riggs, who taught here at, at the engineering school. He taught uh, econo uh, yeah, uh, finance, and he taught engineering uh, in the uh, business school, uh, a little bit of each, and he later became president of Henry Mudd College, but we got him out of Stanford to join us and become the CFO of this little company called Illumatronic. We sold it, had it for quite a while and didn't make much money on it, but it was a good experience. And the way we uh, found most of our deals in those days was just get it. We rented two Pontiacs and we went through all these orchards and looked for something that said electronics on the on the outside or something that looked like it was at least not a prune, you know, distribution point. And that worked pretty well. We became pretty well known in San Francisco. All the bankers said, you're the go-to guys and what do you know about XYZ company? And so life was kind of good. And we were right over here also on the Stanford campus on Welch Road. I never liked that name because it kind of, you know, you want to base your business on a handshake and solid. You don't want to ever welch on your deal. <laughs> we were on Welch Road. But uh, right across from D Draper, Gaither, and Anderson, at Draper, Gaither, and Anderson, we used to call it uh, a deal a day at, D at DGA. <laughs> and, uh, and they were really active, and we saw people going in and out, and, and we were sitting up in this, just the two of us waiting for the phone to ring. But as I say, eventually we became uh, pretty well known by going out. So that, if you're ever starting a business, I strongly recommend you not just sit and wait for the phone to ring, because it won't. But, you, but get out and, uh, and tell people what you're doing, knock on doors, go to some conferences, uh, and, and, uh, and make it, uh, you know, make yourself known. Um, then the, um, the, the next thing I wanted to tell you was what we kind of look for in, a, in talent in, before starting up a company. And uh, we basically looked for energy, for empathy. It's part, I really concentrate on the top person, man or woman, and I look for energy, empathy in the sense of, of understanding. So, lots of entrepreneurs come in and they uh, say, uh, well, you know, here's all about me, and they never ask a question. They never try to <clears throat> figure out who we are. That's not a good sign. You want, you want a leader who is always going to be thinking of his people, but maybe equally important, the customer. 
if, if he's empathetic and understanding, he'll listen to the customer. Listening is very important quality in person. I don't do too much of it, I should do more. But anyway, I, uh, I think that is a really essential part of, of, uh, of, of a good entrepreneur. You look for somebody that's got a vision and the passion to follow it and get it done. You look for somebody who has had good education, all of you have, um, good, good, um, but if not, there may be some reason and you dig into that and try to figure it out as to why they didn't get a good education because you want brain power and you want, and if they're brainy, <clears throat> and they're 20 and they aren't getting a good education, there's something wrong. Uh, you want a, a person uh, who <clears throat> has a, kind of a, a feel for what is out around the corner. Somebody who's also conscious of not only what we all see, but what is in the skunk works. Hewlett Packard used to always ha have a skunk works. They'd do their, thank you so much. They do their development <coughs> of the newest products uh, in a skunk works. Uh, uh, Google <coughs> tells their, their employees, 20% of your time just work on your own thing. And, uh, and, and, and that would be considered a skunk works in those days. Um, so anyway, you want a, a person who is sort of sniffing around the corners. General Dorio, that, as I say, taught business school, of course, to me, said, keep your antenna up. Always keep your antenna up. And uh, he used to uh, uh, say that if you didn't do that, if you didn't know what was going on by asking questions, by listening closely, uh, then you're, you're just not going to, uh, he used to think in terms of being promoted through big organizations, because that's all we talked about. He advised me to, to go into, uh, you know, heavy industry, and I did. I went into Inland Steel. In those days, there was no computer. IBM was just starting, in, but they had cards famous cards that had holes in them and they some would drop out because the rods would would uh, not punch into that into that card um, so today those are the things that I think a lot of people look for in the venture world <clears throat> in an entrepreneur now if I always reason I start with people and what that top person look like is because that's where I think the most important uh, factor is in success versus failure. If you went to see, uh, to Don Valentine, I don't know if he's been here, but somebody maybe from Sequoia, uh, uh, he will say, you know, let's change the people. You know, he's a very tough guy, kind of this. And, and uh, you, if you, you could always change the people but the market's the most important thing. And of course, Sequoia has had terrific success, so I don't argue with that. It's just different ones have a different um, atti attitude toward what is important. But in a way, it's all got to come together as a package. The product, the market, the ability to deliver the product, uh, the, um, the um, uh, teamwork, and uh, and, and all of that's got to fit together as well as, uh, as uh, producing it, marketing it, and, uh, and keeping um, the profits going and having good financial uh, understanding of, of, you know, you don't want to give these things away once you put your heart and soul and your money into it. Uh, so you've got to have a margin, and we look closely at the gross margin. And uh, in the case of a lot of things today, there is zero cost. Uh, a lot of the uh, social networking and so on has very little cost except in the infrastructure. Okay, so those are some things. Now, a couple of experiences uh, that were sort of fun. Uh, the um, the um, uh, 
group of four people came in and they had come over from Atari and I said, well, after you're finished, you know, making these game products and you and you made a lot of money in this new company, what would you like to uh, what would you like to do then? And all four of them said, all we want to do the rest of our lives is to make games. So I thought, we need a president. <laughs> and so I went outside to get a president that had a little more you know, uh, imagination uh, about what the whole world was about. And because I think you don't want to get, you don't want somebody running a company that is just in a, in a total rut and, and just sees, you know, very, but you need those people. So you needed those four. And we started Activision and that was a bonanza. Um, another experience, it was very informal in those days. So the, the difference between today and then is quite dramatic. Um, another four guys came in and uh, to Sutter Hill, <clears throat> which is a company I started um, you know, Pitch and I really started the forerunner of, of Sutter Hill Ventures, and which is still going today and it's a very uh, successful uh, company. Uh, Sutter Hill has um, had these four guys come in. And uh, so they gave the pitch. There's no, there was no business plan and there were no PowerPoints and everybody, by the way, I don't like PowerPoints too much because you're, you're looking up here and you're seeing all these things, but w because I'm a people person, I want to look in their eyes and see a little bit more about what they're about and how they're uh, expressing themselves and think more about, about them than precisely what they're saying. So anyway, no PowerPoints back there. And, uh, and, uh, there were no, uh, you know, term sheets that we would give back. This is the way it works. Four guys walk in, they kind of tell, well, we want to make a, uh, some um, um, new equipment that would uh, be very, uh, 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 what the hell is it called? The, um, the disk drives, or make some new, that, that have memory and you don't hear about them today, but they made a lot of money for us back then. And, um, and we had already backed a disk drive company, Century Data, and we had backed one other one. Anyway, we backed th these four guys, but I, I said, uh, okay, well, it looks really good, interesting. Who's gonna be the president? And they all looked around <laughs> and they said, well, we haven't really thought about that. Uh, we haven't talked about who should be president. Why don't you be president, Jim? You've got the least to do. And Jim Patterson took it to $2 billion, <clears throat> and, which in those days is a big number. And, uh, and it was a very successful company. We did it with those four guys. But I used to just write out on a yellow pad of paper, okay, why don't you put, you put in all the blood, sweat, and tears, We'll put in all the money to get you a year down the road, say, and, and you get 50,000 shares and we get 50,000 shares. Today, uh, that there, there are so, there's so much money and so many venture capitalists that it's more like 20, 80, or, or it's whatever the entrepreneur wants to be, depending on how how uh, powerful his, our, his new product is. But I always still like to think in terms of going 50-50. Then if there, we need more people, we'll both get watered down. If we need more money, we'll both get watered down. But that was the argument. Anyway, I'd write it out kind of like that in a few terms. And then I'd hand it to him and say, and here's a list of our, all of our, <coughs> cust our uh, <clears throat> current in, uh, companies that we've invested in. Take that and think about it and let me know and they come back and maybe it was ended up 60, 40 or something. 
And that's the way it worked, very informally. Uh, we give it to the lawyer uh, eventually, Jim Gaither, who was chairman of the board of Stanford, by the way, at one point, um, was uh, and now a partner of Sutter Hill. But he did the legal work, uh, worked for Cooley, best law firm in the country, and he was the son of the Gaither that was my, my father's partner. Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, all that stuff. Um, in looking at our uh, situation today and the, what, what the, the elements of, of the venture world is, we have attracted a lot of money out of Wall Street and other places the point where now I'm an advisor to NEA, the New Enterprise Associates, they are managing, th the last fund was $3 billion, is under uh, contract. And uh, they are just, you know, a massive operation. So if you're the entrepreneur, you can go to NEA and then you can go to Sutter Hill and you can go to Kleiner Perkins. You know, you can kind of, Talk to a lot. In those days, there were only about three of us. We were the first, and then there was Mayfield, and then there was uh, uh, Arthur Rock, and then uh, he had backed Intel, and then there was another one uh, in those days, but not too. Man, Kleiner Perkins came along a little bit later, and we all shared deals. We had a very relaxed. I, you know, I'd have a three minute. I. I I called the Rockefellers because we had a deal on the East Coast called Apollo Computer. And they put in, uh, we, 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 I said, you know, it's $3 million. I guess we brought, called them and, and one other uh, there. And, and we said, we're going to put in $2 million. Why don't you guys put in a million? The Rockefellers did that. And Greylock put in the other million. They were in Boston, so we wanted that uh, East Coast representation. And uh, they kind of look at it, and very informal. The guys would meet with them, and then it would be done. Um, today, it's a very different process. It's so, it seems almost mechanical to me. But the disadvantage is that we as a venture capitalist, Sutter Hill, don't really have a chance to get checked and balanced by another venture capital who says, it says, hey, have you thought of this? This is really, you know, we kind of liked the idea of sharing. Today, any A can't possibly, Groupon comes along and uh, they want it all, you know, they, they uh, because they got to move the, their needle, they always say. So those are uh, th little bit differences in, in what has happened. Now, I want to tell you about international because, um, Ernestine told me to, to, to cover that. We, uh, I went, as, she, as uh, was reported, I went to uh, Washington to run the Export-Import Bank, and I le learned a good bit about uh, international activity and economics uh, and competition between U.S., I mean, our Boeing versus the uh, Europeans plane and, and Airbus. And uh, we had a very, uh, you know, there was a lot of international things going on. I went to OECD meetings and, and uh, negotiated with, with uh, a lot of the other countries on raising, you know, trying to bring interest rates into the proper line and, and doing various things that, uh, uh, that, that international uh, activities uh, take you to. And then I went to the UN, and I was in Washington for five years, Reagan and Bush, and then I went to uh, the, uh, the UN, and uh, that was a fantastic program, and I, very large grant aid program. Uh, we had people in just almost every country in the world, and we, uh, I got to 101 developing countries and uh, then raised money directly from the parliaments and, and governments of uh, the rich countries so that 
we, um, you know, at that time, it was about a, I don't know, a billion and a half of, of distribution to um, various uh, projects that were not the, the World Bank is the largest, um, uh, you know, um, uh, developing country support system. They build bridges and power plants and schools. We did the software, more or less, the nurses programs, teachers programs, uh, irrigation studies, and cons uh, that sort of thing. So our money went, I think, a, a little further in that. In fact, and it was a great job, and I had the uh, best person I ever worked with uh, was uh, had been it was a Jamaican, and he had uh, he was my deputy. He had uh, run Jamaican Airlines and the uh, Jamaican Central Bank. Small countries send very good people to the UN, and the UN is very undervalued. It's too bad that uh, the U.S. and d doesn't quite get it because there are. It's like Bechtel not not really. Uh, supporting the Chamber of Commerce in in San Francisco, it, it's uh, a, a rather ridiculous thing. But anyway, I got to know the world uh, quite a bit. So when I came back, I um, met this Robin Richards, who was a terrific gal, Phi Beta Kappa from UCLA, from uh, uh, no, from uh, the University of North Carolina, and she was. Uh, you're the Phi Beta Kappa from <laughs> UCLA. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and we um, we hit it off, and and she ended up uh, being my partner after three hours of uh, breakfast together on a Saturday morning, and I had uh, new new good things. It wasn't that I just hip sh I I had gone with a friend of mine the night a couple of nights before to hear her report on a similar idea that my friend had, Bill McClashin to go into Chile uh, with some money and private equity and help get started. So, so she, I knew she was good because she organized a whole group of people. They gave a good report. It was the last one. And so I knew that. She also <clears throat> hit my uh, fax machine with a let's get together and talk about venture capital. So I knew she was a self-starter. I knew she was bright. And I knew she uh, was well-educated, and she was a very pleasant personality, which I learned pretty quickly. So um, we became partners, and we're still partners. And she uh, uh, and I went off. And so here's the thing. Do you, do you do what you know and just do more of it? Or do you try to do something a little different and maybe do it before anybody else. So I decided, having learned quite a bit about the world, and this is where the government experience really came back to help me, uh, was that I, uh, I learned that really a lot of the countries just don't, under, don't have any mechanism of venture capital and, and system for getting going, and so startups aren't really, they're kind of uh, too easy to fail, and therefore uh, there isn't much innovation and, and so on in many of these countries. I knew Asia was growing more rapidly than the rest of the world, and so we both decided that was the place to go. And uh, I better drink this. <laughs> I bet you've been watching it. <laughs> well, I've been listening with rapid attention after going all that way, spending all that money and all that. Anyway, I uh, ended up uh, uh, with her going and checking out China, checking out Indonesia, Vietnam, and Hong Kong, and we ended up going to India. And truthfully, I had been to India a number of times, and she had gone just the summer before. So we didn't do that together. We decided we would go there, uh, and that would be our country. So, And on the first stop, the um, first time we did go, um, I, I happened to know the, the uh, man who is now prime minister, but he was then finance minister. And before when I knew him, he, he was between jobs. He had been head of the central bank of India. 
and uh, a great guy. So I introduced her to the new finance minister, who Manmohan Singh, who had really began to turn India around. And just like in a business, if you have a leader that knows where he's going and can take them, the 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 rest of the the uh, organization there, he began to turn India from being insular and not interested in outside help and outside, uh, you know, uh, cooperation and, and outside uh, influence. They were, ever since, you know, Gandhi's time, they were very, we can do it all inside. Well, you can't. In a world that's getting smaller and smaller, you've got to be, in order to be competitive, you've got to, you definitely need to have uh, an understanding of where the where the um, the benefits and pitfalls are in the world, and then work with it. So we did the we uh, went to India and we had a, we ended up going about four times a year, four or five times a year. We picked. She had a connection that got us to a man uh, named Kiran Nadkarni in Bangalore, and uh, Kiran became our first partner, and we together hired another man who's in Mumbai, Abe Hivalder, and we started up from scratch in a strange country with very little money, and because I went to Harvard and a couple other places. I didn't go to Yale where I had gone, uh, because I had been on that board and I was a little worried that I'd be, you know, sort of conflict of interest. I should have, because everybody that invested got 16 times their money back in six years, and, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't. But anyway, we didn't raise uh, a lot of money, but we it ended up being, you know, 75 million or something like that. And from mostly a few friends of mine, a couple of my partners at Sutter Hill, uh, all of my partners at Sutter Hill, um, very, uh, limited group anyway, it was, and one institution, General Atlantic. But I would advise you all to do that, to, to do something, break out of the box. We were the very first company, venture company, to go to India and, and cross-border uh, invest. And, um, and it worked, because we were first. If we went today with that amount of money, or four times that amount of money, we would have marginal returns, I'm sure, because it's picked over, it's well oiled, and we're in a very competitive. So I was lucky enough to be the very first venture capital in the very first venture capital company in the West, and in the very first venture capital company that was cross border with India. Now there are probably 25 or 30 of them. So try to be first. Try to be early. Try to be unique. Try to be um, uh, well, uh, get your name out there. And so think in terms of, of uh, now with the internet, it's a lot easier than it was in those days. But we, um, by going to the then finance minister and then getting, we, we said, well, how are we going to get the word out? So I have one friend named Tata, who's a big name in India. And I knew him through the UN again. And he, uh, I, I said, Ratan, how about being an advisor to us? We're not going to pay you. We're not going to probably have, have you do much, but I need some, uh, I want you to be uh, an advisor. I didn't say that we didn't want you to give any advice, because that would be pretty. But basically, I wanted about four, I, I wanted to get about 20 people to be advisors that were Indian and, uh, and that would have some. So he helped me, and I learned some other good names. And we got a list of advisors. And then we put that out, and, and that helped us raise money. Um, and it also helped us in the country. And as a matter of fact, the only one we got ripped off on, we did probably 30 deals, 
in India, and the only one we got ripped off on was a guy who was uh, sort of working on production for Hollywood, uh, Bollywood uh, uh, films. And he had a production studio and everything. And I didn't like, I really, it again made me think I should have followed my instincts about the guy. And also one of my advisors said, yeah, I, w I wouldn't do it. But somebody that we wanted to work with there in India that was doing private deals went in and I, I kind of wanted to be a partner with them. So it was mixed, but I, we, we lost all our money in that one. So I'm going to say this, that go international, think international, don't necessarily go, but think international today. Think about where you can be unique and think about where there's a growing market and, a, and an exciting uh, new product that you can deliver or service that you can deliver. We were delivering a service and some money. That's the product was our money. And, and, uh, and also some advice, I mean, you know, we serve on the board and help build up uh, the team and, and all that. We couldn't pretend to do that very well directly ourselves. But um, it, it all worked and uh, I would recommend that you be an optimist, not a pessimist. If you look back through the, wor the history of the world, the optimists are the ones that have really um, really done well. But you've got to be smart about it so that if you hit a peak like Robin and I, uh, you know, found there were some times when, gee, let's sell because time is um, running out, things are going to collapse, it's overpriced or something. That's different. But in general, be optimistic and you'll, uh, you'll be much more successful than than if you're a pessimist. Now, uh, on that uh, note, I think maybe I'll just stop. I'll just say there is um, there's a lot of fun in, in venture capital, and uh, and it's uh, and there's a lot of fun in being an entrepreneur. I think the entrepreneur, honestly, if he's successful, can uh, have even more fun and pride because he built something or she built something very significant and they can always look back. Like I look at Sutter Hill. I really started that company up and I'm very proud of it. They've had a 31% IRR for, for the 20 years I was there, they had 42%. It slipped a little, but it's 31%, it's not bad. And, uh, and I'm very proud of that and, and uh, very proud of, of the uh, Draper International. We declared victory and went home because the, there were some, uh, Robin wanted to have babies, she's now got four, and uh, she wasn't gonna be so much a part of it. My wife has Parkinson's and I didn't wanna go to India four or five times a year. And so we decided to, you know, just uh, bail out at uh, at a at a peak, and it and it probably was the right thing. Although I always kind of regret it because, in in a lot of ways, because I hear back that the Draper name is Draper International name is really well known in India today, and uh, because we were first. So, so I'm going to stop there and then just let you guys. Uh, uh, shoot at, at whatever you want to do, uh, whatever you want to ask and, and, or, or talk about. Yeah, um, I was definitely thinking for questions if everyone can get into groups of three and try to think of a question that you think Mr. Draper can't answer um, and buzz amongst yourselves for a minute. Can't answer. Yeah. <laughs> Tough question. Okay, who's got a question? Three guys are going through. Pardon? Pardon? What? You know, what happens is oh wait, wait, wait a minute! Wait a minute! <laughs> You're gonna brainstorm now? No, they're they're gonna go in groups of three and get questions that you can't answer. Wait a minute! I got another trick for you. I haven't told you anything about about the uh, foundation and the startup of social uh, entrepreneurs. 
that we decided to put our money into. And, and I've got a case study. For, I've got a case for you on that subject. So what I thought we had talked about would be, let's just have a little free form now. I mean, if you want to break in, into groups, that's fine. And ask questions, well, that's fine. Let's do that. But will we still have time for me to, I got a case that'll take them five minutes to read. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Up to you, so we can either. Okay, let's do that. We'll let you break up and do whatever you want to do. You have one minute to think of a question. For Mr. Hey everyone, uh, we're going to start with the questions from this side of the room and going around. So starting with the answers. Um, so I guess you were saying how venture capital has kind of changed over the years from an informal model to a more formal model. Yeah. But does it seem like the entrepreneurial model, uh, entrepreneurs going out and starting companies, has that changed a lot or has it stayed the same over the years? Well, there was no social, social networking. There was mechanical things, you know. The, the chip was the big driver in the valley, and hence it's called Silicon Valley. Should be called Terman Valley because uh, Dean Terman was, uh, you know, the provost here and, and head of engineering uh, at Stanford, and he's the one that brought business together with academia. And uh, uh, so the entrepreneur, okay, so the entrepreneurial model, every model of every company that starts up is different. In some slight way, in some cases, in some massive ways, in others. Uh, the, um, if, you're a, if you're an entrepreneur and you've got, you know, sales talent in your genes and you just love selling and you, you know, you've got a place in life. In our economic system, you've got a big place. If you're a financial guy and uh, you have, uh, you will always have a, a place in the model. So to that extent, the model hasn't changed. There will always be sales, marketing, finance, manufacturing, and manufacturing maybe not. I mean, but some kind of programming or some product delivery. Um, and uh, how else has the model changed? Uh, the model's got to be more international. Everybody, you know, some of you have come from abroad and, and uh, lots in the Valley have, and every other company started here in the last uh, 20, 30 years has had at least, every other one has had at least one immigrant in the founding team. So I'm a big believer in cross-fertilization and ideas come across the ocean. And there isn't much um, basically that's changed in a model of a company that is successful though. And, um, and I think uh, it's a very good question because uh, um, there's, there's, there's talent uh, uh, in, every, in every company and you got to tweak it a little differently. Each model is a little different, but um, that hasn't changed. The, the, the basic needs for success have not changed. It's a good question, though. Um, so I was wondering, like, if you're trying to make a corporation from the ground up um, and you're looking for a problem to try to solve, how do you go about finding a problem that's worth solving? Um, because nowadays I think there's a lot of companies that... Wait, how, how, do you, how do you go about finding a problem that's worth solving? And how do you know that's something that, you know, you're building a company around? Well, that is a $64 billion question. I mean, in other words, everybody's got ideas. And everybody sees, pro I see the traffic problem driving into the city. I used, till 
last week I had an office in San Francisco. Now we've got an, uh, moved our office down here uh, to Menlo Park. And um, I used to commute and think, every day I'd think, this is a big problem. <laughs> I want to solve this problem, but I, I'm not going to quite have the time. But somebody should solve the problem. So we get in a little caboose, and uh, it's got cushions, and it's got lights and TV and, and things on your ears, and, and you've got uh, anything you want to do because it's your office, and, and then it's going to get on, and you're going to hook on to a high-speed rail that goes at 200 miles an hour, and then you're going to hook off and go, and it will. You push a few buttons, and it will drive you to your office. So that's my idea. <laughs> I, I think you got. I think you're the right guy, as a matter of fact, to carry that out. So that's. But the uh, but the point is. The ideas come from all over. Everybody's got lots of them. You've got to get something that's practical, that's going to get done in your lifetime, that's going to uh, also uh, deliver some goods that are going to be valuable. And, and you know, some people, luck has a big part in, uh, I was so lucky. I, um, I sent Howard Hartenbaum, who's taught here. You, you all know Howard, right? You're right, right? Howard Hartman at August Capital. Uh, he, uh, he was my, uh, is still my partner. And um, Howard, um, I sent him to um, Europe because it was so, he hadn't done anything in venture capital, but he'd been an entrepreneur. And I said, you know, it's awfully crowded, all these this, tons of money in venture capitalists and probably 150 of them in the Valley alone. Uh, I said, why don't you go to Europe? They, there's not much going on there and competition. And it's very important to consider your competition, by the way. And uh, he went over there and backed a couple of deals for, and gave me uh, the idea to, to support a couple of deals. And then he lucked into, uh, because m my son had uh, told him to go talk to Kazaa, well, he found that Kazaa had gone bankrupt, but he was smart enough. So luck played a part for him and for me, but smart enough to say, where did the founders go? And he followed them up to Sweden, and he, he uh, met with the two founders of Skype and helped them write their business plan, and I made the very first investment in Skype. Uh, now, the idea that Skype had might have come out of Silicon Valley. As a matter of fact, there were other people that had the same idea, a good uh, voice over IP system, but they couldn't deliver it. There was some, st it just didn't sound like a landline. And so the technology there was terribly important that it really sounded just like a landline, and so we, Anyway, we backed this company with a good, with a, a good idea, but the, the execution is more important than the idea, I guess I would say in general. But uh, I'm glad you asked the question because it, 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 it makes me uh, express my thought that, you know, there's an idea day in, your, in everybody's head that comes in, but but boy, it's, it's really carrying them out and getting them profitable. It's a big, complicated job to get an entrepreneur. The entrepreneurs have the highest divorce rate in the, in the world, I mean in the country. And, uh, and that's, you gotta be prepared for 14 hour days, but you have a lot of fun. I mean, it's just, you're in it and, and you can't think of, you'd wanna do anything else. Yeah. Um, so the startup ecosystem, uh, nowadays, kind of optimizes for short-term gains, and this is pretty big in like Web 2.0 type companies. And you see tons of startups that are just making a model that's built on another model, built on another model, and they can be pretty good for creating, you know, kind of big returns early on, but are not really sustainable models in the long run. Um, and I mean, this criticism comes strong, like strongest from 
firms like the Founders Fund that are sort of trying to invest in more hard science and that sort of type of thing. Where do you see the ecosystem moving? Do you think it's sort of going to go through potentially another, not as big collapse as the bubble, but you know, all of this overvaluation of this Web 2.0 type thing will turn into, do you think the money will move towards kind of biotech once, the, once that market becomes, you know, easier to access and so on? Or do you think it's still going to go and stay in more in internet technologies? Or where do you sort of see it going? Yeah. I, um, uh, I'm not a big visionary. Um, and so that's why in both my nonprofit foundation and in my venture work, I depend on the entrepreneur to give me the vision of where he or she thinks the, the world is going and where they're going to fit in and how I'm going to make a lot of money supporting them and have a lot of fun. Have a lot of fun. You've got to think about that. I mean, if you, anyway, if you see somebody you just really like, the personality and everything, um, uh, you're going to have fun and maybe you don't make the most money in the world but it as long as you don't lose money you feel pretty good about it. I've even lost money on some people and just been delighted that I was involved. Uh, but my feeling is that um, uh, I tell people that if, I mean yeah, I said this in the book, I'm not sure, that if I were to be telling my son to study something I would tell him to study biotechnology and get into that field because the body has changed so much in the last 10, not changed, but the body has, uh, we have learned so much about the body in the last 10, 20 years, it's dramatic. And I can see that that's going to accelerate through non-invasive methods. And, uh, you know, we look back at some of the things we're doing to our bodies now and laugh. I won't probably, <laughs> but you will. And, and I'm, I'm just saying that you, um, it is a good industry to get into, but it has been very complicated by government uh, rules and regulations. The FDA takes forever. I think, I think I read in the New York Times yesterday or today that something like, this is the first, somehow the, the first uh, pill that they've approved at the FDA in the last 13 years. I mean, there's something, I, I must have misread it, but, but it's something like that. I mean, everybody who's in the industry says it takes forever. And so it takes gobs of money to keep going and, and deliver. But once you deliver, you can save lives and do wonderful things. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, telecom is going to change. We're going to have uh, nothing but a wristwatch, and we'll be able to, uh, you know, we'll have a Dick Tracy <laughs> wristwatch. You guys don't know Dick Tracy, but I grew up with Dick Tracy. And, um, and so that, you know, it, there's going to be changes in the, in the transportation there big time. We're going to go to the moon a couple of times, you know. Everybody. I'm sure you guys will get to the moon. You're going to go to the moon. I'm, I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. You're going to just want to be one of those that, that I mean, maybe only be 6% of the country will, but I bet you 6% of the country goes to the moon. Uh, what's the next question? Um, we were wondering if the, the characteristics of investment you look for in India are the same as in Silicon Valley. Um, and so, like, what what kind of company profiles were we looking for there versus here, and if there was a difference? I wish Robin were here because we'd have a lot of laughs. I mean, we go to this down this little alley, and we walk up these eight flights of stairs, and we find a little oily guy in the back room, and and uh, we say, "So you want to?" start a company, or, or so this is your company. <laughs> and, uh, and it was quite different, uh, particularly when you're in the startup phase now. On the other hand, we met with people who are now, you know, among the 10 richest people in the world, 
and we're then just emphasis, the president of emphasis, uh, we met with him, superstar guy, he's the Dave Packard of, of India, and he was way ahead of his time. He had a campus, educated all his, um, his people and gave them all stock. Um, he, he was a terrific guy. He, the guy who was working in the back room, uh, he called him in and he said, you know, this glass, for example, he's talking to us, and this guy is standing there trembling. This guy, glass, for instance, is very important that it be clean. And he said, it's very clean, congratulate. You know, this, that was his job. Everybody in the organization had to have the idea that his job or her job was really important to the success of the company. And that's why that man is so, that's uh, Murti, uh, Narian Murti. Uh, India was complex. They had a, 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 an SEC that, uh, you know, very cumbersome and it made it difficult to, to get your, your, uh, your stock difficult to know the rules, you know, and um, and there was a lot of government involvement still, even though he was this man, as I say, Prime Minister, uh, who's now Prime Minister, was uh, trying to cut away a lot of that and make it a lot easier for foreigners to invest and for, uh, and for uh, companies there to buy their goods abroad and trade and all that, which was pretty new, and this is 1970, this is, um, sorry, this was 1994 that we started in India, and it was amazingly uh, backward at the time we started there. And now, you know, I, I've been back in a number of years, but, but um, I understand it's just uh, really dramatic, although they've got worse log, uh, traffic jams than we do in, around Bangalore, apparently. Um, it was different. It was uh, in the mor The morning is the evening there. You know, it's about 12 hours, so we have to organize to, to call them late 6 o'clock at night here to get them in the morning. Or I did yesterday. I just talked to India yesterday. Because uh, we still have one deal. It's the Ahu of India. And, uh, and we're trying to get rid of it, but we bought rupee stock. It's another problem. We brought rupee stock, and then about a couple of years into the company, it was doing well. It was like Yahoo, and uh, and uh, it still is. It's a very big operation there. We own 15% of it. We've sold all our other ones out of the Draper International, but this one is still hanging because we got rupee stock, and 10 years into, uh, I don't know, a few years into um, our investment, he said he wanted to raise money in, uh, in the U.S. with ADRs, they're called ADRs, uh, American Deposit Re something. And um, we said, sure, gosh, great. And then we raised 45 million or something going public here. Well, the stock has been way up in the clouds and we were dying to sell it. We couldn't sell it because our, our rupee stock didn't convert because of Indian regulations that say we want you to sell it through the uh, Bombay Exchange. And we don't have, this entrepreneur has not taken it public on the entrepreneur, ex, on the uh, Bombay Exchange. And he, he's not great at making money. He's a good advertising guy and has a lot of, you know, if you want to know what's going on in Bollywood or, uh, or, uh, going to uh, the cricket matches or something. You go to Rediff, R-E-D-I-F-F, -F, but I, I wouldn't recommend you buy the stock because mm -hmm. we want to sell it, <laughs> unless you buy ours. <laughs> uh, who's over here? Yeah, so our question for you is when you're presented with a, an investment pitch that's very, that's highly technical or highly scientific in terms of the technology that underlies it, how do you balance the um, subject matter expertise that you get from consulting with people versus the uh, more intangible things that you look at, like energy, empathy, passion of the entrepreneurs? 
Well, yeah, part of the... Um, somebody at the top, I mean, if, if the CEO has a history degree like I do, he better have a goddamn good CT, you know, CTO. Uh, uh, and uh, so I, I would say it goes without saying, if you're trying to break through in new technology, that you better have the sharpest possible technical brains in, in, the, in there. And you don't have many people. So, so somebody better be able to do a lot of things. Uh, but you want the top person, technology, that's a good question because you, wanna, you want the top person to be attracting the very best. You know, I'll tell you a story about uh, USC, uh, University of Southern California, where I was last weekend. My granddaughter goes there. The guy that Sample was his name, the president of SC, this is a good lesson in, in management. <clears throat> you know, they were kind of a second-rate school, I would say, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but the, with a first-rate football team, and all you thought of was SC football. But this guy became president maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I think. And he was great at raising money. What did he do with that money? He w said, okay, I got these, I don't know, 15 departments, let's say. And he went out and selected the very best person in the country that he could to run each department. I don't know that he did the whole thing, but, it, but in the, every time he made a change, it would be he'd go for the very best and then assume that that very best guy would, or gal, would bring in uh, talent just, so he overpaid with that money. He overpaid the very best. And it drives me wild when I hear these uh, politicians saying, oh, you know, those bonuses paid to the president of General Motors is running, you know, it, all these bonuses, they shouldn't be paid millions of dollars, you know, and it's just wasted. Whoever runs the place is making a huge difference, not just within the employee group, but the barbers and the doctors and the dentists and the tailors that, that are supported by, by those uh, the employees of that organization are all dependent on his making the right decisions to do this. And if you've read today's paper, the, the uh, General Motors made more money last year than any other time in its whole history. And you know, they're the ones that were rescued by, uh, by Obama and, uh, and Bush. Bush was involved too uh, 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 with the government bailout money. So there's, uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I would say get your very best technology talent and make sure it's in place. Yeah, if it's a technology company, it better be, that better be good. But what I do is, is uh, check with a lot of people who are sharp in that field, and I don't try and, you know, say, well, I don't know, let's program that again together, you know. I, I'm, not, I'm not in that field. How about it down here? Sure. So uh, we, were, we were talking about kind of uh, Silicon Valley and how failure is kind of acceptable here. And uh, we were just wondering, since you've been in the Valley for a long time, how many failed entrepreneurs have you actually backed, people who have gone out and raised a lot of money and just lost it all? I can't count them. A lot. But everyone was an experience. Some led to a, another experience that turned profitable. Uh, and I had a lot of fun. And there's the old saying, you know, you, have, you back 10 deals, and if you've got one deal that's 
10 or 15, 20 times your money, you can lose all the rest. So you only, they, they say you only lose your money once, your, your investment in a company once, but you can make multiple times on the winners. Uh, and so uh, one, uh, so that the answer to that question is a lot, but uh, so probably, but that has changed too in the, in, the, in the time I've been in the Valley. At Sutter Hill, I would say we had no more than 25% losers. The rest we made money on in one way or another, and some very big time. And the reason was, in those days, the whole country was fascinated by this uh, technology going on in the Silicon Valley. And, uh, and so a big we, we had a company that punched uh, cards at a gas station, Datanamics it was called. And, uh, and we were going to sell for $100 to each gas station. Well, it was a, it was a failure, but we sold it to address a graph, multigraph, I think, or some, because they wanted just the team. So the team of technology people uh, was important in an acquisition. So we no longer had to write, I mean, at that time, didn't have to write off all those um, bad investments because we just, in a way, sell the team. We were in the, you know, trafficking business. <laughs> So anyway, we're, we're, uh, we, we, it has changed uh, to that extent that lots of things are known now around the world. So, and, the t and the teams don't always want to be sold. They, they at, the, at the last minute, negotiate a whole different thing, and, and, and the capital, venture capitalist is kind of cut out. So there's a little ethical thing. You've got to work that out and make sure uh, make sure that you do that right. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.